Hi, welcome to OutThink. I'm Lawrence Akers, clinical hypnotherapist, member of the LGBT community, and a passionate advocate for mental health. Today, we are talking with David Clark, who is going to talk about his experience of being diagnosed as bipolar back in 2011, and talk about his journey helping to work through the diagnosis. Dave, thanks for joining us today. Hello. Um, so, I guess let's go back a bit. You were diagnosed back in 2011. Mm -hmm. Up until that point, did you have any inkling or any any thought that you may have been bipolar? Um, no, simple answer to that. Um, complete surprise, although having read other people's memoirs who've been through the experience of a diagnosis of bipolar, there are clear signs, uh, warning signs that the brain is dysfunctional or misfiring. So the biggest sign that I didn't realize until I did have the diagnosis and read other people's memoirs was brain snaps. And we don't even have that term in the UK. Um, it's recognized here. So I had a brain snap uh, when I was about 19 in the second year of my degree. Um, lasting seconds, um, unexpected, embarrassing, another brain snap in the second, uh, um, when I was 26, uh, to, uh, an account C Viva, another brain snap when I was 33, when I was in a meeting with my director and his boss about a management paper and another brain snap in a Moscow airport, um, because there was a problem with my visa, a problem with them letting me fly back from Moscow to London. Um, the brain snaps are caused by intense stress, which the brain is unable to process and it res results in a verbal outburst. Okay, so when you say a brain snap and a mm. verbal outburst, mm. you know, what does, for someone who is seeing someone having a brain snap, mm. what does that actually look like? Um, quite scary because you're having a conversation with someone like I'm talking to you now, um, but then all of a sudden the person you're having the conversation with will just have a verbal outburst that will be loud, intense, aggressive, um, and then disappear. It's like a volcano exploding and then just going into complete calm and it just lasts seconds. And as I said just earlier, they happened every eight years. So I never really understood why these brain snaps occurred until I got the diagnosis of bipolar and then read people's memoirs and these people with a who'd written about their experience also had brain snaps. And so when you were diagnosed with mm -hmm. bipolar, mm -hmm. what was your re initial reaction to it? How did you, how did you <laughs> well, process it or feel about it? Jeez. Okay. So when I got the formal diagnosis, um, uh, uh, that was in September 2011. So my head would have been a complete mess. Uh, at this point, I'd just come out of a psychotic episode lasting six months. The psychotic episode was induced by work stress. Um, and my brain went into a tailspin, upwards, downwards, sideways. Um, in around March 2011, uh, I was, uh, my employment was terminated in the job I was in. It was a high um, stress, high performing high paid role um, and uh, I was never sectioned for six months somehow I managed to live eat function somehow um, it was a very interesting experience I write about it in my book um, I went to see my GP three times he never did anything whilst trying to prescribe me lithium of course when you're psychotic you don't think you're ill you're just very pleased with life um, I went a second time to see a different GP late May in 2011. He referred me to a psychiatrist. That psychiatrist gave me Seroquel, low dose. And I took the Seroquel and came out of the psychosis uh, May, June, July, August, September, mid-September, walking down the street going, what's going on in my life? What's been going on the past few months? It's very weird. How did your, your family and friends react with the diagnosis? lost all my friends they disappeared went oh you're not well that so they, they all went really hard to well you know when you're when you're up there you just kind of you know and it's just when you pe pe read people's memoirs it's the story you know you yeah. just everyone disappears because you're like oh you're not well so you know i've reconnected with some of them and explained and everything so that's all good but it's it is intense it's intense for the individual it's, it's intense for others around them um the family um they um 
So my, my father passed away in 2004. So, um, you know, he was undiagnosed and his mood swings are incredible. So um, it, it's hereditary, bipolar is hereditary. Um, but my mother was in her latter years. So for her, it must have been really challenging um, listening to her son half around the world, jabbering on like a twillet. Um, and it was, you know, when somebody's psychotic, they jabber. They just talk without breathing, um, jabber, jabber, jabber. Uh, high energy, kind of coherent but incoherent. Um, so it must have been hard for her. Um, I did go see her in the latter years and explained everything. Um, and she kind of understood it. And, you know, it is what it is. But I shouldn't have had to be psychotic for six months. And so going through that experience, what what... At what point did you start to kind of rebuild, <laughs> for want of a better term? Oh God. Like, I mean, it's a hard question, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, like no, no. Well, well, it's not a hard question. No, it, I've had to tenaciously rebuild myself. So it's kind of like, what, uh, where to from here? So when you're diagnosed at the age of 44 with the second most intense major mental illness, you kind of go, oh, well, what next? And the system is so dysfunctional, so counterintuitive, you have to take control of yourself. So as I mentioned in my memoir, you have to take control even when you're not in control. So I had to go see a second GP for a second assessment while I was psychotic. So that's how bad the system is. And never sectioned with a psychiatrist. He never sectioned me, um, even though he said I was clearly psychotic. So that's a bit of a question mark. Um, he gave me the cerebral, the cerebral got me out of psychosis. I had to, uh, I was thrown out of my apartment because I wasn't paying the rent. Um, I managed to find somewhere as a house share. I managed to rebuild my life. It's taken me six years. The system is stuffed, full stop. And I know before we started recording, you were, mm. you were sharing with me some of the, the difficulties that you've experienced, both mm. at a state and a federal level. Mm -hmm. there. Mm. Um, and I think we, we, we absolutely agree mm. on the fact, especially at a federal level, that there seems to be a complete Huge a lack of understanding mm. or support for yeah. mental health services yeah. in this yeah. country. Yeah, totally, totally. So, and it's especially interesting because the current federal minister's on record in the age being interviewed when he was appointed that his mother went through the similar diagnosis. So I believe he's on a mission to help, but um, the system is so dysfunctional. Um, I've had to feedback to my psychiatrist that he's not well. He asked me about a private meeting and what was discussed. That's unprofessional, inappropriate, unethical. He's accepted that. But why should I, as an individual, have to call my psychiatrist on his behaviour? Um, and I've had to call my GP on his behaviour. Um, but again, you know, it's just a reflection of the system. I've also had to call Centrelink because they made me unwell twice. Again, I'm an individual. Why should I have to call federal state systems on their unhelpful behaviour, culture? performance whilst I'm helping myself get better. This is a big question. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll put it out. There, we love though. big questions. Um, what do you think needs to happen to help improve? <laughs> that is a big question. Yeah, it, it okay. is. It's, it's almost a, yeah. look, we okay. may or may not be able to answer let's, this so one, let, but No, let's no, I can. I, oh, I can answer anything. Um, it needs to be turned <laughs> on its head. So we need more patient-centric services. Pa pa uh, patients need to be heard and listened to. Clients need to be heard and listened to. Um, the whole point of Centrelink is to help people regain health and well-being and get themselves into some form of paid employment. The way Centrelink is operating at the moment is totally counterproductive, counterintuitive. The whole system is wrong. It needs completely redesigning. Um, it does need... So does the mental health system. They're trying to turn it on its head to start focusing on actually what individuals need, but it's so big. It's such a big task. Uh, the federal and state government have issued... 10-year plans. Um, state government are kind of making progress. Federal government have delegated to the primary health care networks. The timescales are tight. They're trying to make progress. There's money being pumped through the system, but it's so huge. Um, the scale of mental illness is so huge. Um, the challenge is so huge. Um, and people are being dishwashered, is the way I describe it. Um, especially through the NDIS, where yesterday I heard that people have to produce all the documentation all over again um, relating to their mental illness 
to get into the NDIS. Why, when all that information is in Centrelink already, mm. and Centrelink and NDIS are federal government systems? This is ridiculous. Yeah, it feels like a lot of double handling and a lot of additional mm. stress for people who really don't need that stress. For people who can't even get out of the morning when they're depressed, yeah. are going to have to deal with an NDIS system that is trying to help but is requiring so much detail, so much information, reports from psychiatrists, GPs, that those people have already provided to Centrelink? Really? Mm. Yeah, it definitely feels like there's it's, it's something of an afterthought. And, and in mm. some ways, I can't blame people for feeling that the government is intentionally making it incredibly difficult for <sighs> people to be able to utilise these services effectively. I really question what they're up to. Um, intention is a big word. I prefer the word ethically. If you're ethically trying to help people get better, take the stress off them, redesign the service around them, not on top of them, focus on helping them, not training them. Mm. Going back a, a little bit, um, for those people that are listening that may not know what bipolar is, mm -hmm. I guess it'd be interesting to, to get a little bit of a definition because I know for mm. a lot of people there there's almost this um, stereotypical view of what bipolar is and almost being that split personality thing, mm. um, which, you know, you see, if, if you, I remember back in the 80s, there was a country practice on here and mm. uh, one of the characters in it uh, suffered bipolar and uh, was displaying very <sighs> behaved. Hey, yeah. I, the ironic twist the actor who played that Mars Buchanan didn't mm, go on to mm, actually mm. have bipolar. So the so I've got to be I'm quite careful with language. So you don't suffer bipolar; it's an experience. Mm. You don't. Uh, you, it's not an identity either. So um, I run a meetup group for people diagnosed with bipolar mood disorder, and they say I am bipolar. I say, well, are you actually yeah. bipolar, or is it a diagnosis? A I argue it's a diagnosis. Distinction. It's yeah. a moment in time, a reflection of your brain chemistry, because bipolar is explained through a missing brain chemical, that most people diagnosed with bipolar are high performing. However, are missing a certain brain chemical that results in the brain spinning out if it's unable to deal with a lot of stress through being bombarded with a lot of information that it just tips into either psychosis or depression. So the person either... Um, spins into mania um, or to depression um, depending on what the issue is that their brain is being pushed out against. So with the mania um, stress I was being overloaded with information my brain was trying to find solutions to multiple problems on across multiple projects. With the depressions that I experienced it was related again to work can tell where I'm going with my mission in life coaching. Um, <laughs> depressions were caused because I was identify, I was associating my whole identity and self worth yeah. to the job I was doing, and I was yeah. having difficulty because I'd emigrated from UK to Australia, finding the right job, um, getting interviews, but not getting the jobs, and just feeling lack of self worth, spinning into depression, and the depressions I've never had before in my life until I came to Australia are really horrible. You disassociate, you become an animal in a cage, and I can recall some of the experiences were really bad. Yeah. Never again. I think the distinction you made there about identity uh, mm -hmm. in relation to diagnosis is such a valuable one mm. for people to take on board. You know, you see people come in, uh, coming in here even saying, no, I am anxious, I am mm. depressed, mm. I am... Mm -hmm. And I agree, you need to stop and go, well, actually, no, you are experiencing mm. that mm -hmm. in this moment. You mm. may not always experience that. Correct. You certainly are not that. Mm. Uh, you're as much that as a smoker is a smoker. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but this is the power of language. You know, we don't realise how powerful language is because it actually is more powerful than we realise because it actually influences our identity our thoughts, language, behaviour. And if we're not consciously aware of what we're saying, doing, the way we're living, how do we realise that the results which we're experiencing in life, we are totally accountable for? In terms of what you did to start improving on yourself or to, to take that new direction, mm -hmm. and I, 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 got, I get a very strong sense that it's aligned with a, a passion and direction mm -hmm. where you're mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. How did that start? What did you discover? 
Oh, goodness me, good questions. So, um, ironically, whilst I was psychotic, I read um, What Colour Is Your Parachute? Mm-hmm. Um, which is a well uh, bestseller, well recognised book on people who are going, what do I want to do with my life? Um, from reading that book, I decided a life coach would be a good path to take. I was psychotic when I read that book and mm-hmm. made that decision. I was psychotic when I did the intake weekend for the coaching course. Nobody realised I was just talking a lot. Um, I used to train people, so I do talk a lot, but most of what I say when I'm well makes sense. Mm. When I'm psychotic, it makes no sense whatsoever. And when I'm depressed, I say nothing because I'm depressed and it's not very good to be in. Um, so I, when I got well again-ish, I pursued the diploma, finished the diploma, um, felt empowered um, because of what life coaching talks about, self-empowerment, taking control, recovering, balance, being calm, being happy, la la. It all made sense to me. So my brain followed on. Um, following down that further, learning about mbraining.com, uh, head, heart, gut, three brains going, actually, if my brain's misfiring, I can get out of my brain into my body. Mm. Connect with my feelings, connect with my intuition, and that has guided me. My intuition especially, my gut instinct has saved me, totally. However, that has also resulted in me on a, being on a bit of a mission because of what we said earlier about the system, federal and state being so flawed. So it'll be interesting where it goes. I'm not quite clear, but I do have a clear mission to help transform the lack of connection with patient-centric service, patient-centric service delivery, which is totally not value for money. So many billions are spent on mental health provision and it's not delivering. And you think that it has some sort of ability to audit or, or watch the success of what they're doing to determine if the benchmarks are being hit. And I can see you almost falling off your chair in, in uh, a fit of laughter there at that whole suggestion. Uh, are you laughing because you believe this is oh, obvious? <laughs> I have been through the Australian National Audit Office website to look at what they've done on Centrelink. And they did a whole series of reports about 20 years ago, 10 years ago. They've done nothing since. Um, something's going on there state government have tried to audit mental health in Victoria, um, didn't really get mental health services. It's a very complex service to audit. However, now the state government has a mental health plan that says it's going to report annually. Let's hope the state audit office audits state government to track progress in implementing the plan. The state plan is vague. It's non-specific. It does talk about human rights. It does talk about the problem. It kind of talks about the solution, but it's not really very good. And then there's the NDIS, which is going to totally transform the way mental health services deliver and is going to cause, I really hope not, but more problems than it um, solves. Right. And and this is a shame because, you know, we have the World Health Organization highlighting that depression is going to be Correct. one of the biggest killers Correct. out there. Correct. Uh, even if we look at things like uh, mental health in the workplace associated with bullying, it's, it costs the Australian economy something like $200 billion a year. Mm. Mm. Uh, it's estimated that 50% of all Australian workers are going to experience bullying mm. during some point in their career and, mm. and the mental health issues that are associated with that. Mm. We are talking about something that really needs to have far greater focus and energy and commitment put towards it Mm. yet we seem to be i don't know if it's because uh you know if you if you sprang or you fall over and hurt your hand for instance um people can look at your hand and go wow that looks really Mm -hmm. sore Mm -hmm. you should be resting it up and Mm. and stop what you're doing Mm. whereas if you were to call in unwell at work and Mm. say i'm i'm calling in unwell i'm i'm struggling (sighs) with depression Mm. The response will generally be something along the lines of, look, suck it up and get in here. It's all in your head. Mm -mm, Suck it up, princess. Yeah. Uh, uh, Look, this is is the biggie. This really is the biggie. And this is where um, deep scale transformational cultural change will happen because um, the way the world is turning, especially this year, um, people are really walking away from politics. Politicians... um, what will happen next federal election will be interesting. It'll be interesting to see the result in two weeks time of the UK election. Mm. 
um, especially with what's happening there. Um, and with the USA as well, people are really fed up with politicians not listening, mm. not acting. And um, with regard to the bullying, there's some big work to be done there. Mm. Um, politics is full of bullies. Um, there are some politicians that could be argued are bullies. Mm -hmm. um, really, they're supposed to be serving the public. They are elected to serve. I question whether politicians are all serving. Some are, some clearly are, I, some really are. I think it has moved more towards self-serving in a lot of cases. And I then, don't want to get too personal, but it needs to change. Yeah, you, a lot of them bringing their own ideologies into uh, into politics, you know, especially if we look at the, the likes of Cory Bernardi uh, and the ultra conservative side of things there. It, it, the impact that he is going to have on the mental health of LGBT people, look, uh, single-handedly, is almost as well. You got to you got to understand politicians. So the politicians, some uh, some are deeply unwell, deeply disassociated. Politics is a very fascinating for me field because of the connection of politicians between themselves and the people they serve. Um, the degree to which they listen and act to meet the needs of the people they serve. Um, I think it also comes down to how authentic they actually exactly, are. Exactly, exactly. If we That's look at really someone like um, Macron in, in uh, oh, France... Oh, my God, that man is going to be fascinating. How much um, do we love him already? Well, because it I feels know, real. You, but you've got to understand as well, that there, see, he's... There are some fascinating people. The way he's dealing with Trump, you know, the handshake, mm. the way he dealt with the G7 and went to um, Merkel and then the others and then Trump last. Um, and now he's gone to Putin. So it will take time. The young generation have had enough. Yeah. They will transform the way politics is delivered. Um, even in the age today about um, marriage equality and all that sort of stuff, it will change. But those that don't listen and act will be requested to leave. Mm. So the next election will be interesting because there will be a lot of people who will lose their seats. Absolutely. Changing tact again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you've written a book, uh, WTF, Life is Not Always What It Seems, mm -hmm. which I believe is available on Amazon. Correct. Um, tell me a little bit about the, the creation of this book. How has this book, how this book come about? And, and mm. was it something that you found to be quite therapeutic mm, in a sense? Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting because I never, I, you know, one of those things you you sort of through your life, you go, oh, I'd really like to write. I'd like to be published. And you never get around to it. And then all of a sudden you have a major mental illness and you get through it and you navigate it and you go, this is chaos. What do I do with it? And you go, write a book and release it. Um, so in the book, I talk about my life story, um, growing up, uh, in a country village, moving into the town, uh, through teenage years, all the challenges of growing up as a teenager, grappling with my sexuality. So I didn't come out until I was 26. Oh my goodness. That was the biggest challenge ever. Um, dealing with a dysfunctional, angry father who apparently beat up his wife, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, I uh, talk about the psychosis. So there's a whole chapter of my psychotic writings, which are quite interesting. Um, my experience with the mental health system, again, dysfunctional. When you've got a dysfunctional brain, not helpful. It's all in the book. Um, and then the journey there on in. So I talk about how I recovered from the psychosis and depression. I talk about the depression after the psychosis, the medication that I went on that I've now got off, the fact that I've lost a lot of weight through using a naturopath and acupuncture and the into the last chapter of how I've calmed down my dysfunctional bipolar brain. And I refer to my bipolar brain, the fact um, that we can rewire our neurology, mm -hmm. neurochemistry, if we so choose. And that's the thing, looking through the book before, seeing that there's, you know, examples in there on NLP, mm. neuroplasticity, all these really exciting mm. movements forward mm. uh, in in psychology, Amazing. mental health, mm, mm, mm. Uh, neuroplasticity being, I guess, one of the, the, the big buzzwords mm. in more recent times. Mm. Um, and obviously, every person is different. Every person Correct. is going to respond to different approaches and, and different techniques in very different ways. Mm. 
What techniques did you find personally resonated with you and, and made the biggest change? So the biggest change is story. What's the story? Mm-hmm. Um, and connection and purpose. And it's, you know, the, it's even been interesting in the last few weeks and months because I have just been um, dealing with so many issues. Uh, my apartment got flooded um, due to a leak in the upstairs um, apartment. Uh, all chaos there, dealt with that. Um, uh, dealing with a Centrelink dysfunctional um, approach that I dealt with through my federal MP. Dealing with a psychiatrist that's asking me about uh, private conversation and wanting to know what was discussed. Um, calling that. Um, just dealing with so many issues and then dealing with myself and going, why am I procrastinating getting back into paid employment? Um, because I was coaching sort of, but I was sort of faffing myself around. And what it was, was because the psychosis that I experienced in 2011 was work related. So then I had to unpack all that in myself to release all the stress and nonsense, anxiety within myself that I was aware of because I've got the toolkit to understand myself and what's going on with me. That has been the biggest challenge that because of the lived experience I've had with bipolar, nobody medically qualified could understand because they haven't been through the journey. Anybody who's been through the journey can understand the journey and the um, nature of the challenge in dealing with self when self is flawed. Mm. And I have no doubt that as a coach, you work with a a wide, diverse variety of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you find, though, that you also attract people who have been through a similar journey yourself? And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, what kind of um, insights have they had from working with you? Um, so the, the insights they have, I mean, even we had a meet up on Saturday is self-worth is the biggest challenge Mm. because if you lose everything, if you lose your sanity, if you lose your identity, so you lose your sanity through uh, mania, uh, psychosis, and you lose your identity through depression because you just become worthless. You know, who are you? What are you? What can you achieve in your life? If you go through what I call a dishwasher experience with your head, what, you know, and there's nobody out there unless you connect with somebody with lived experience, which I've been able to through memoirs and actually listening to people who've been through experience, realizing that actually I can recover. I can heal myself and reconfigure myself to create meaning in my life. And that's where I'm at and that's where I'm going. So it's, it's just having hope and people that inspire you to go, I can do this. Is that one of the biggest challenges with people that have gone through what you have, that that, um, sense of hopelessness? Yeah, because there's, um, uh, you know, Stephen Fry has been a massive, massive uh, Mm. leader in addressing mental health stigma. You know, just sharing a story, sharing experience, being authentic, being a person who is happy, fun, did QI, totally out there going doing the manic depressive you know stories with bbc and it's all online youtube and everything you know and just sharing saying this is what i went through i went to africa and did this documentary and was uh suddenly slipped into a psychotic episode and had to ring my psychiatrist and my psychiatrist said you're not well come back we'll help you out and just you need to slow down um and he's stepped down from qi now sandy toxic's doing it and he's just you know, but you do need someone who you can trust to be able to call and say, I don't think I'm well. Am I unwell? Yes, you are. Sort yourself out. What do you do to help manage your your state of mind to know that, you know, if you can feel something coming on that you yeah. need to take that step back? How do yeah. you manage that now? Delegate upwards, backwards, downwards, sideways. So when I talk about the nonsense of sense link and um, mental health system, I went through my federal MP and my state MP because when something is so hard, it shouldn't be, it should be there to help you and it's not, you just go, enough. Delegate. You're elected to help me. You're elected to help me. Help me. And they did. So good on them. But the system is so dysfunctional and it shouldn't be. Tell us a little bit about um, what it is that you provide for your coaching. How can people okay. get in touch with you if they cool, want cool. to? So my website's karma coaching, C A L M E R coaching.com. Um, Dave Marty Virgo on Facebook. My um, Facebook page is Lime Green Solutions. I post a lot of stuff on there. If anybody wants to contact me, 0413 508 306. Um, I obviously, I guess, have a bucket of experience and skills and ability if I can recover um, from psychosis and depression 
to where I'm at now, mm-hmm. which I believe is a pretty good state of mind and health. Lost 12 kilos. Uh, my naturopath says that my gaydar age is 42. I'm 50 this year, which is not bad. That's great. Um, and um, yeah, I think I'm in a pretty good place. Um, happy to help others in any way. What does the future have in store for David Clark? <laughs> Sorry about that. That's really funny. Um, well, I don't know because I was invited to join the National Audit Office Value for Money Development Team um, as a newbie. Uh, that team trains people to do value for money work from senior management to newbies. So I was very anxious when I joined the team. I was like, whoa, I'm going from small scale uh, work on audits published to parliament to huge scale training both internally uh 200 people uh senior management liaising and also internationally i'm being expected to deliver so i went through a bucket load of self-worth anxiety i was such a mess for about six months Mm -hmm. um because nobody told me what my job really was i was given tasks to do i just went through so many self-confidence issues it's unreal I navigated through them. I rose to head up the team, resulted in me training in Denmark, Hungary, Romania, um, Turkey, uh, Northern Turkish Republic of Cyprus, and ultimately in Moscow, Russia. That was the icing on the cake. Never could anyone have told me you'll be working in Moscow. I did. It was a total success. At that point, I thought, wow, cool. Can't go anywhere further. Emigrated to Australia. Long story there by the sounds. <laughs> well, it is, but it's kind of like the way you get over yourself and your self-judgment and your self-worth is by just going, do what you can, yeah. enjoy life. This could go anywhere. Um, you really, if you push yourself over your anxiety and self-worth and lack of confidence, can have a most amazing life. And, you know, my half-sister has read my memoir and goes, geez, you are a total overperformer. That book is an incredible journey. And look at you, you know, you're just quite something. You're the black sheep of the family. I kind of always have been. Um, what are we related? And of course, we are related. My father was a bit of a um, uh, overachiever, but just grumbly fart. Um, <laughs> I am not a grumbly fart, but always will be an overachiever, and it's kind of just me. It is funny though, hearing what you said there, because one of the reoccurring messages with the clients I've been working with over the past few days, and it mm. seems to be the universe telling me this is to uh to get out of the way of myself mm, mm. totally uh, totally you you what what okay so one of the guys are the meetup on saturday is an artist but he was so self-judging oh nobody's gonna buy my art nobody wants to see my art nobody really likes my art i really don't you know i want to do some <laughs> stuff but and i said okay there's all these millionaires in melbourne and victoria and australia and around the world all these millionaires with big apartments big houses big blank walls going i need some art bloody hell where do i go for art there's a guy out there somewhere who would produce the art i need i have bucket loads of money in my bank account i want to give him money for his art but he just won't create any art because he's sitting in his studio going i'm not good enough well how about you actually do some stuff Mm. put it on show and then that individual go fill their walls with your art and give you a bucket loads of money quite easily and he went never thought about it like that oh god i'm gonna start creating art it is ironic, though, that, you know, people come into you and say, I feel stuck. I feel stuck. I can't move. That's the key issue. But then they turn around and say, oh, but I can't do that because no one will like it. And it's like, well, we know now why you're stuck. You're stuck because you're in your own way. Yeah. So here's an idea. Tell yourself to shut up and move out the way and get on with doing what it is that you feel that you want to do. Correct. And that's where we are in 2017, that the more people get out their own way and get rid of self-judgment and trust their gut instinct, trust their mission, purpose, value that they can add in the world, and the more likely they are to enjoy a calm, happy, flowing daily life. Exactly. Um, now, we will put links up on our website uh, at Release Hypnosis for where people can purchase your book. We'll also put all the contact details that you have said earlier as well, in mm-hmm. case people wish to get in touch with you and, and experience some coaching or some work with you. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to thank you so much for your time today to come in and to share so openly uh, your experience of what it was like to go through everything you've gone through and, and to get out the other end and to find that there's so much self-worth there 
uh, self-acceptance and I'd say a bright, exciting future ahead. Thank you very much. And for everyone else, thanks for listening and we shall look forward to you joining us in the next fortnight. Until then, please stay safe.